Okay, the first thing we're going to do is pray for um, stable internet and uh, no technical hitches. Welcome back to Angela's Caches. I'm in Ireland, Heather's in London, and um, Pepsi and Shirley, I love that analogy. And thank you for all the feedback uh, saying that people were enjoying this. Um, we're just to, I'll revert to what I said first of all, www.ee, uh, wise wild women exposing evil. So I haven't spoken to Heather in a, quite a while and um, I'm looking forward to this. So I hope you are too. So welcome back, Heather Brown. How are you? Prue Halliwell, AKA Prue Halliwell. Any updates? How are you doing? Okay, um, the, the host said he's decided I'm everybody under the sun. Firstly, I'm running a fake YouTube channel. How can you fake YouTube? It's like faking the Bank of England is company. How can you fake YouTube? No, they do. But they, I do. They, you, they do. Yes, I find that you can because the stills they've taken from the videos that were made to take down about, they have put it on, it's on Google's front page when you Google us. Um, pictures of us, and when you click on the pictures, some of them are going through to porn sites called something YouTube, some non YouTube or uh, something YouTube, which is an unsafe site. So I don't know why they're doing this. One of them goes through to Heather Brown MP3 uploads, which is all different people called Heather Brown, none of them is me. So why they have done this, I don't know. I think they're a bit crackers. Yeah, I think, I think it's. I think it's cornered rat syndrome. I watched a movie. Well, I, think I think they must be on drugs or something. Or maybe they need to be on drugs. <laughs> well, I watched a movie when I was quite impressionable. And when you corner a rat, I saw this movie and the rat jumped up and, and dug its two front teeth in somebody's neck. And they were like shaking. They were like shaking trying to get this rat off their neck. <laughs> I don't know. Rats are, rats are actually very sentient creatures. They live in family groups and look after their own. Well, I, I know, I know. I've got a girlfriend, Posey, whose daughter used to have pet rats. And I, I know all about them being, you know, clever and loving. But that, that movie put me off rats for my whole life because there was this rat hanging off somebody's neck and they were going like this, trying to get it off. <laughs> But anyway, planting pornography, if that's what's happened, is a, a classic tactic. You know, it's like these guys, I think we've got five YouTube channels taken down now. Mackenzie's Devils, Remember the Devils, Mackenzie's Devils 2, Mackenzie's Devils 3, 4. So I think we're on the fifth takedown. Um, and, and they're pissed off. They're pissed off. Well, I'm going to apply for the job as Pope because I'm omnipresent, because I am running, I am running the fake YouTube channels. God knows how many channels they're saying there are. I don't know what's on them. I've never seen them. I've looked for them, but I can't find them. <laughs> I don't know where to look at them. The problem is I'm also running the hoax and Satanist um, WordPress blog that somebody has set up that nobody knows who set it up. Yeah, I'm accused I'm of that. I'm also a person called... Well, I'm also a person called Susan Garnett, Garland, um, who is an actual person, and I'm very certainly not Mrs. Garnett, Garland, in any event. I know, well, know her, I say, I did some legal work for her some time ago. Wow. And I'm certainly not, well, she had, an, um, she had a case of constructive dismissal. And, um, well, she gets on to them and they'll know about it, but so far she's had five people sacked and two people deported. Right. And she's had a large supermarket chain that she worked for promised to give her a job back, although she tried to sue them for it. And she, she got 50, 52 or 54,000 settlement out of court. So she wouldn't go to the press. Right. Because what has happened was these five people had got some jobs as managers and supervisors and they'd gone down the tills sacking each person, one person a week. And then the next Monday, their friend would arrive in the person's job. So they were taking over the store, these people, and they were nicking whatever they liked. And nobody was saying boo to them because they were managers and supervisors. So they tried sacking her and she went ballistic. She had me gone around with surveillance because I've got, I used to work as a mystery shopper and I've got surveillance equipment. I've got like watches with cameras and Bluetooth earpiece with cameras. 
a pen with a camera in it, a pinhole camera in this pen. So she'd been wandering around there, shot for hours at a time, filming them. And she ended up, she got the five of them conspired to get her sex. She got them sex. And she wasn't happy with sex. Off she went to Lunar House and got two of them. They were Nigerians. Right. And she kept calling them the family Robinson. And I thought, because they were calling each other, oh, my sister, my sister. And I thought they were related. Well, no, she was calling them family Robinson, like Robinson gollywogs off the, off the jar, Robinson's jar. So she's called them family Robinson. I, oh, just wa- them- I just want to give some context there, because when I was little, I'm going to be 60 in June. When I was little, um, there was a Mar- Robinson's Marmalade Company they used to they used to have free gollywogs as they called them. Yes, you collected yeah. these up to get an actual gollywog. Yeah, yeah. And, and originally wog, which is now regarded a derogatory term, it used to stand for wealthy oriental gentlemen. But the gollywogs was part of social engineering. And then the first time my sister Kathy, she's sixty two now. The first time she saw a black person, she came running in the house and said, Mommy, Mommy, there's a gollywog coming down the road. So it's like racism was indoctrinated into us. And sometimes this is why I love the whole um, where black people actually laugh at the racism and call each other nigger and stuff like that. Because I'm not racist. I don't intend to be racist, you know, and um, but this was just part of our programming for the past 50 years. Well, Gollywogs actually originated from Enid Blyton books from the 30s. They didn't originate from the jars. Wow. They originated from, I think it's called the wishing tree or the magic tree or something. Wow. And that's Gollywogs. Gollywogs came from Enid Blyton books. They didn't because they were a doll. They were a fictional creature. They weren't actually. Yeah, but they say that. They anybody. say that. They say that. But, like, I grew up on Edith Blyton and, like, you know, the famous five and the secret seven and, and that whole thing. Social engineering, it's like the more I research it, the more it's been going on. It's just mind-blowing. But anyway, not, not to worry yeah, about anyway, that. she was calling them the family Robinson. And I could just picture going into a tribunal hearing with this woman and her keeping on about the family Robinson did this and the family Robinson did that. And I could imagine the other side advocates saying to her madam are you saying these people are all related and her turning around and saying no they're big effing coons <laughs> because she said it's the thing she was coming off of. and i'm thinking what the hell am i going to do because i can't go into a tribunal hearing with this woman because she if you tried to stop her from this sort of talk she would start i have rights i can i know i know i know people everything. act out but she wasn't racist with other people. It was only these five that had conspired against her because I get the distinct feeling they were quite racist themselves because they were getting everybody the sack and they yeah. were replacing them with their own yeah. people near enough from their own village where they came from in yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. So she, she wasn't, I never saw her being that way with other people. No, but I know. It's like people go think, by personal experience. It's like... My mother was a Dupre and the family, they were all military. They were all like Navy or Air Force or whatever. My, you know, my uncle died in World War II. My grandpa got um, shrapnel in his lung in World War I and that eventually killed him. Um, And they were French Huguenots who came to England. And, but they, they were from, like they moved from Wally Grange in Manchester to Hornchurch in England with Ford and they were racist. And um, I remember saying to my Nana Dupre, Dora Dupre, I was staying with her and I was making the bed and I looked out the window, Bruce Avenue in Hornchurch. And she said, Oh, this used to be a lovely street till the Catholics moved in. And then she looked at me because my mum had converted to Catholicism to marry my dad. And she went, oh, I suppose they're like black people. They can't help the way they're born. And I was just like, (sighs) I just, I just couldn't like make sense of what she was. I wasn't, you know, children don't understand racism. And then my. Have you ever lived in Loyalist Belfast? You'd understand it quick enough. <laughs> I was there for two years in the 1980s, and I was there as a small child. Well, I was, quite, I was 
I was raised to hate the British. I was raised to identify as Irish Republican, which my father thought he was. And then with my research, turns out not at all. But I was raised to hate the British, but my mother was British. But she converted to Irish Catholic and she was more Irish Catholic than the Irish Catholic, you know. Well, I then lived my teenage years, since I was 13 until 19, in Killiney in South County, Dublin. Beautiful. So, well, not now it isn't. It used to be, but now it's destroyed. It's terrible now. I'm wow. hearing awful stories about it now. Wow. Yes, mm. it used to be very safe, but there, there was no such thing as handbag snatchers or robbers, and we used to walk around all hours. Yeah, no, Kalini, um, Dorky, Bray, they were all beautiful. They were lovely. Yeah, well, they're not now. Well, they're you should come and visit. You should come and visit, and we should go and do a little uh, nostalgia tour around Kalini and Dorky and Bray and Hope and all those places. You should come and visit. Hope, did you ever say? Huh? Hope, did you say? Did you Hope, say Hope? Yeah, Hope, yeah. That's in North Dublin. That's um, near Clontarf. No, I know. That's yeah, my sister the used other to... Side. My sister used to live in Malahide and Port Marnock. So... Yeah, that's by Hope. Yeah, but it's still lovely. I mean, we, you know, anyway, that's just by the by. So tell well, me... Well, it's lovely Phil Lynott's mother. She lives in Hope. And she went to a Phil Lynott um, tribute thing, which she was arranging in central Dublin. And while she was out, they burgled her house. Oh, God. Yes. So that's what it's like there. But it used to be you like, we, we, we would leave doors and windows open at all hours in Kalina. Yeah, I know. I know. And the same, like, even in rural Ireland, we leave the keys in the car and the front door open. But... You know, I suppose those days are, I don't know, but... Well, I think they're long gone. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Well, this Garnet woman is a friend, a Garland woman is a friend of them. Um, she's a friend, she knows this Ella person. Her, she has a sister, she has, um, I think, it's, I don't know if it's a daughter or a daughter or not. Well, everywhere you mention, she's got relatives because I, I had to, twice I've met her face to face the rest of the time on Skype because I had to go and file. Um, she has to come with me to the court just for the exemption form because she's exempt from the filing fee. So she's got to bring her ID and fill in the exemption form for me to file the stuff for her. So she came with me to the court and every place you mention up and down this country, oh my, this one lives there, my, that one lives there. And do you know this street? And do you know this person? And I'm no, 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 because I'm thinking she's going on about Gollywog. How am I going to? go into a tribunal <laughs> thinking what have I got myself into I'm <laughs> thinking how the hell do I get away from this person but somebody she'd gone to people on the internet and they had directed her to me because I was in the same postcode as her right so um because she didn't get legal aid so because she didn't get legal aid because she owns a house somewhere else so she couldn't get legal aid because she has is considered to have money so they sent her to me, and I'm thinking, how the hell to get away? <laughs> because can you imagine if she started the Robinson family and the tribunal allows her? Well, why are you calling them the Robinson family? Oh, because they're big coons. Oh my God! Can you just no, imagine? That's what, that's, that's, that's what I was going to say about. That's what I was going to say about the Tidbury part of my family. They owned. They were big into Jaguar, and they owned factories and Lionel Tidbury, and so on and so forth. But they used to talk about coons and wogs, and I used to be mortified. I, I just used to be like, and then there's the whole urban myth about my mother's family was hugely wealthy, but a Jew stole all their family wealth. You know, and I just used to be like, Mum, there's every family's got an urban myth about how a Jew stole the family jewels. Do you know, it's like... But it may it may be true. I don't know. But do you know what? My mum's eighty three, and she's ill in hospital. She's probably not going to be at the family wedding tomorrow. But anyway, bring us on from that. So so. But the thing you need to know as well is that legal people, like legal lay litigants like yourself, you're worth gold because you know legal aid's not going to support any court cases that are controversial 
or that are going to make the system well, it's not that it's because of the the law reforms and the reforms in legal aid it's not easy to get legal aid in family or employment tribunal and for various other things i know politically. i know so the like so people send people along to me all the time and um I mean, I had that blooming Sabine sending people to me and she nearly got me into a whole load of trouble. And I removed myself off of Sabine's... Um, I still started think, sending me things to do. Call me naive. I still think... I still think they're a product of social engineering, but I still... I don't see Sabine or... I think Belinda's a, um, a, an Eastern star. I think she's a female Freemason. I think she's an ex -ch uh, children of God cult member, but I still can't get myself to see them as the real enemy. I don't think they're the real enemy. I think the thing we're most guilty. Well, I of think the pair of them. Go ahead. I think the pair of them get involved with legal things and they shouldn't because they know nothing about the law. Well, they, they, they've got track records. Sabine doesn't claim to be a lawyer. She's a data analyst. She's a scientist. She told me she knows nothing about family law. And I, no, I didn't know her. I said, why? She's a scientist. Well, she interferes in people's cases. Well, anyway, like, my bottom line is I've been pretty harsh on Sabine and Belinda. I do believe Belinda was Freemasonic Eastern Star. I do believe she was ex-children of God. I do believe she's super naive and a bit, a bit, uh, what do you call it, condescending. But I, I think she's very calculating. Well, yeah, but I don't think she's evil. And I don't think... I don't think she's some Eastern Star because I don't think the Eastern Star would put up somebody like her. Well, there's somebody called Yolandi Kenward. Who, oh, I know about her. She's from Kent. She's, um, yeah, I think she's, she's um, quite Kent. decent. She's standing, she's standing in the election. Yes, I know she is. But she, I mean, that doesn't negate the fact that she's crackers. And this tale she tells about, she's another one that's a bit wide where the money thing is concerned because she tried to say she didn't have to pay a mortgage because they'd made a mistake. They had adjoined her two mortgages for her business and her house. Well, you still have to pay your mortgage whether they have adjoined it or whether they don't. So she tried to use loopholes to get away with not paying hundreds of thousands of pounds. Oh, she's a smart aleck, the, this Kenwood woman, and she's got several names as well. Well, she's Yolandi Kindridge and Yolandi Kenwood. But to be honest, even though I've got emails, and I'll release them probably not today, but I've got emails from her venting about Belinda being Eastern Star and Belinda being like that with um, Theresa May, Theresa May and Belinda sabotaging her months of work where she was trying to protect the grandson of, um, what do you call him? Oh, it's gone out of my mind. Um, African dictator. Uh, it's gone clean out of my mind. Robert Mugabe. No, no, not Mugabe. Um, a, a, he's a cardinal or bishop or something. Um, oh, I know who you mean. Um, um, oh, I know who you mean. Um, oh, he was on TV with, TV with Michael Stone. He's from South Africa. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, bishop, bishop, somebody or other. Tutu. Uh, Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu. Desmond Tutu's grandson and mother. But he doesn't recognise the grandson. He doesn't recognise the but the no, South African. Of course African he doesn't. Of course he doesn't because you know how many people have multiple children all over the place that are illegitimate, like Bill Clinton. But of course he doesn't recognise him. But the the mother and the grandson were very brave in whistleblowing, and they were only transiting through the UK, and they grabbed the grandson. And they sectioned him and they kept him in England. And yes, I know the whole tale. Yeah, mm. and, and Yolandi was doing fantastic work to get him free and to whatever. And she says Belinda thundered in and pulled strings within the Eastern Star, including with Theresa May, 
and she, Belinda got him. Theresa May is not an Eastern star. Well, you don't know. We don't know this thing. I'm only saying what I know. But what Yolandi told me, and I'll get the emails up sometime, but what Yolandi told me was that she did months and months and months of work. And I believe her. Uh, for well, she probably thinks she did. No, no, I believe her. But then she says, Belinda... Oh, what? Right. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the Stanley range. But oh, for God's sake. She says then Belinda swept in and pulled a few strings within the Eastern Star and totally undermined everything Yolandi had done. But never mind, that's beside the point. Um, first of all, talk to me. You've been fairly harassed by Oakstead, haven't you? Oh, well, they're saying that I'm everybody. And this lunatic, what she called this Blurton woman. Oh, Shiva Burton. She's a fucking Shiva nightmare. Shiva Blurt. Shiva Blurt out. She's decided I'm some bloke called Kyle. <laughs> they're saying that I'm this person and that person and the other person. They've also alleged that yourself, myself, and some other person who I don't know are drug traffickers, drug smugglers. This is what they put in one of their videos. They're in serious legal trouble because... Yeah, um, yeah I know. What they seem to think is that um, nothing can be done about them because they're trying to keep themselves secret. They're hiding their identities. Well, that's very good grounds for me to go and get an ex parte order against WordPress and against them. And because if, if, the, if the respondent is evading service, yeah. that gives you grounds to get it without them even being there. Yeah. So they're evade. So I can go to some nice the masters or some nice high court judge of the day. Yeah. And at a legal order because they have breached a thing called the Burn Convention as well. Okay. They're saying things that because WordPress is in America, there's nothing we can do about them. But the USA has signed up to the Burn Convention, so yeah. there is something I can do about them. And very um, quickly, I can do it as well. And without yeah, their knowledge, good. Without them knowing, and without them, for all they know, I could have their personal details right now and be passing them around they don't know exactly. they don't know whether i have gone to that court and whether yeah. i have gotten a legal because i've spoken to wordpress i've yeah. had a nice telephone conversation with some wordpress staff in san francisco and um for all for all the hoax that people know i could be going around right now handing their names and addresses to people no i know i know Handing out their details, I could have pasted them up all over the internet in places where they won't find them, but where yeah. other people will find them. Yeah, there's been a lot they're of progress. Very, and they think they're untraceable, but they have left an indelible digital footprint. Yeah, no, They for are sure. very traceable. For sure. And, yes, they are. They Which are is why they're so desperate. Everything they're guilty of, they try and mirror. So they try and put a body count on my name like yes, they, project, they do a lot of yeah, projecting like hillary clinton and then trying to add in pornography sites because for instance um comet pizza there was forensic evidence found of child pornography going out from that site and it was handed to the fbi and the cia in december and it was just covered up and ignored but i wanted to tell you do you remember you told me when you got blocked well, I'll tell you, there's somebody, there's a wonderful researcher, lovely campaigner, been working for two years on Hampstead called Kristen Elizabeth. And she fell out with Chris Costa, who I recently exposed, and Arthur Cattell also exposed. But she said she fell out with Chris Costa, and then Chris Costa blocked her. And um, at the exact moment that Chris Costa blocked her, it activated a block from Shiva Burton as well. Yes. Well, that's what I said. That's because also there are pingbacks. If you look at, um, if you look down the commentaries, there are pingbacks that lead to Shiva Burton Cross of Change yeah. sites. Yeah. Yeah. So so. The sites are linked up. My guess is this: Shiva Burton was blo was um, ignored by yourself and Belinda McKenzie, and she didn't like this. And do you know, I have yet to meet one person who is not from Hoaxstead that actually likes this Shiva Burton. Everybody hates her. No, uh, she's, she's the one same. of the most hated people that yeah. I have ever seen. I know, because 
she I do believe she's an agent. I do. She may have been abused because a lot of Satanists come from intergenerational abusive families. So a lot of them have been brought up in this. And if she ever wanted to break free, I'd be the first to say to her, look, let me help. But oh, I'd let her go to blazes. <laughs> yeah, I'd let her go to blazes. I don't like the woman. I mean, no, I, I, have nothing, I have nothing to do with Hampstead and I never did. I know. I know. That's Sabine. She sent me stuff about a girl called Lizzie Musa. And you know those Musa children that were... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Lizzie Musa was the oldest child and she was put into foster care near where I live. And Sabine sent pictures of Lizzie Musa, like wanted pictures. I wonder what goes on in Sabine's mind sometimes, but she sent like wanted posters saying a thousand pounds for whoever gives me the address of favour of Lizzie Musa. But that's, and a I nice, think, that's a nice thing to do. I would, if I had it, I would give a thousand pounds to find Gabriel and Elisa. I, I, I think that's a nice thing to do. Well, I'll tell you what, whoever you gave the thousand pounds to would be going straight to jail and the thousand pounds took off them because that's what the authorities would do. Because that's what happens to you if you go around exposing the addresses of children where there is a children's act matter, where there is a care order especially, you will go to prison and you will go to prison for two years and you'll have your assets taken off of you. So, um, I mean, Sabine, what I said to Sabine, I called Sabine up and I said, listen, this girl is uh, in the area where I live and I have, I told her about my son and she started the boo hoo 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 hoo. I cannot listen to this. This is too much for me. Ooh, I cannot listen to this. Oh, God help stop, me. God stop, help stop, me. stop, stop. And she, she's going on and on and on. And I was raging. I said, well, <coughs> what, what, do you, what do you want to know people's cases for if you can't listen to this? No, no, she's I just know. emotional. She's just emotional. It's like... Oh, no, she wanted me to shut up and go away. She wanted me to shut up and go away. Um, and I don't believe she really wanted to know where Lizzie Musa was either. Um, I don't know what her game was, but the next thing she sent that girl from Cambridge shit to me who planned to, to get me yeah, to Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, the, the little madam was telling me that she, she was painting this she wouldn't turn on her Skype camera. She told me she had no camera. Yeah, I and then when she, wanted me, uh, she had a camera because she wanted me to watch her three-year-old while she went off and did something. And she put him in front of the camera and she turned on the camera. And I said, I thought you said you'd no camera. She said, oh, no, I just said it doesn't work. No, she told me she'd no camera. She didn't tell me it didn't work. Um, so, I mean, Sabine knew what she was, but she was actually advertising herself for sale by the R on Bebo. You see, but, but the thing is, Heather, people are damaged. When people come from generationally abusive or an abused families, they're damaged. It's like... Well, she was adopted. She didn't come from generationally abused anybody. Yeah, but she you was, were adopted, but you don't know how that... Was I wasn't born. adopted. I was stolen. There's no adoption stolen. of me. Yeah, well... They just took me. They well, didn't... There's they, no, uh, there was no documents, nothing. Yeah, well, these days, that's what happens in the UK anyway. But I do. Oh, I said, well, it happens in Northern Ireland, and I'll tell you what. Um, when I started kicking off about it in 1993, there were a number of people arrested and taken to the courts, and it was all kept silent. Yeah. Um, supposedly for the vic the victim yeah, shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The same with King Cora. The same with King Cora. I can't believe that stayed covered up for as long as it has. The well screams. Everybody knows with the bomb that blew up. Um, Louis Mountbatten's yacht with three young boys on it, and uh, everybody knows what was going on with King Cora. It's just well, I lived in East Belfast in the eighties, and everybody knew what was going on then. At yeah, King Cora. Yeah. That Billy McGrath was running, and Billy McGrath was known well, to be a paedophile. He was an Orange Georgia paedophile. There's only Richard Kerr survived. I think he's the only survivor left, and like. He nearly broke through and got the truth out. He was on Sky News and ITV and everything. But it's all gone away again. It's just heartbreaking. It's devastating. Well, because the inquiry in Northern Ireland dealt with it. Well, dealt with and it. How? They, Tell me how they dealt with well, it. Well, they sealed it. Apparently, they wanted to seal it so it wouldn't be um, looked at. Yeah, sealed for 100 years or 75 years. After I started picking off, they actually found out there were a whole lot more people who'd been 
the births falsely registered. So what they did was they went around arresting the people who had falsely registered these births. Because how most people found out was their blood type was different to the parents and the birth yeah. certificate. Yeah. Couldn't be the parents. Yeah. So um, more and more of these cases turned up. And somebody I knew who's a manager in Chichester House in the birth death and marriage in Northern Ireland, he said to me there had been an inordinate amount of actual prosecution and police inquiries into this. But they, were, they um, had done it secretly uh, because they didn't want the, vi- the victim being the person whose birth was falsely registered. They wanted to preserve anonymity for the victims. Yeah, that's but a little bit of That's a no, little bit The victims didn't care because we all didn't care if it no, came out that our births had been falsely no, registered. I know. I know. We wanted these people exposed. It's the same. So the victim- Sorry, it's the same as people saying that Gabriel and Elisa's names and faces should never have been released. Those children wouldn't give a damn about being public if it saved them from being sodomized and raped and brutalized and tortured and forced into uh, cult indoctrination. It's well, like, this seriously. is another thing. This hoax that have gone mental because I have said these children are in the care of Barnet Social Services and that's where they will stay. Because the mother doesn't have a settled home and she's not in this country, she can't take them. Well, Ricky Damon, the last anybody looked, he was sworn in off to Los Angeles to try and be um, a house sitter, wasn't it? Oh, that was a year, more than a year ago. Well, he doesn't have a special lifestyle. No, no, he's been in Leeds. His his mother and his brother, who are also alleged to be in the cult, and his grandmother, they're all based in Sheffield. I think his brother works in a hospital. And so he's been traced to Leeds. And then occasionally back in Hampstead, although he doesn't live there anymore. He was on the dole. He was on housing benefit and everything in Hampstead. Well, that doesn't make any difference if he had a settled lifestyle. Yeah, well, there is no, no way been, that the... He was in Hollywood and he tried to get a house sitting job and go to auditions. But he was busted on that with Hampstead Research. And then he went to the Philippines with the children and apparently no, didn't go with the children because the children are not allowed out of this country i'm they talking so about nine animals. months ago i'm talking no, about they have been under a care order for a long time they yeah. are not allowed to be taken out of this country the, the how the law stands is nobody may remove the children from this children's act says and the legal order will say it. nobody can take them out of this jurisdiction except the local authority for a period of no more than 28 days. Yeah, they so went on a holiday. They went on a holiday. The social you're, services go with them. But the social services go with them. You're presuming that social services are not corrupt, and that's not, sadly, that's not accurate. But no, anyway. I'm not presuming they're not corrupt, because I know all about social services, as we know from my own case. Yeah, I know. But I know that it says that, that, that I know that that is the, 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 that is the law, and that's the law for everybody. Yeah, but people don't Only the, the social law. services. They well, don't obey it. The, well, I know this. The foster well, anyway, woman took my son to France to live, and yeah. I had to get Mrs. Reed from the Hague Prevention Department in Council of Europe to threaten Bexley that she was going to get the French police to put the, to put the social to put the foster people in a French jail. Yeah, they didn't get my son back within 24 hours. Yeah, and they were gone from this country for 10 months before I found out that they had sold their house. They had been coming to the contacts and bringing my son to the contacts and telling him not to tell me that they'd sold the house and gone to France. But the social services knew about this, it turned out. They knew that these had sold, had sold their house and gone to France. There was somebody... So when they were, forced, they were forced to come back and they had no house to live in. So the Bexley Council put them on the homeless register and gave them a five-bedroom house. They got a five-bedroom house because they had my son. If she didn't have my son, she wouldn't have got anything. But she owned a chateau. She'd sold her own house for 430000 She'd sold a piece of land at the back for another 100 or so thousand. She'd bought a chateau with a swimming pool and six bedrooms in the south of France. What was her so, name? Linda Dole. They live at 75 Upper Park Road. That's the house they got because they had my son living with them. How do you spell her last name? 
D O L E, dole, as oh. in on the dole. Yeah. Because how, when, she, when they came back here from France, they owned that chateau with a swimming pool and she was claiming housing benefits. I know. But if you own a property in France, you can't claim housing benefits. But this benefits. is why I'm saying you can't count on the law being obeyed and you can't count so, on... I happen to know from inside of Barnet that Ricky Dearman hadn't a chance in hell of getting those children. They weren't taking the children from the mother to give to him. A, he had no relationship with the children for years. B, when he did come to take them out, when they were forced to go with him, the boy wouldn't speak to Dearman in Dearman's car. And Dearman threw the two children. Now, these are children maybe seven or eight years old. So he stops on the freeway and puts them out of the car to the side of the road and leaves them there for three quarters of an hour. Yeah. So somebody like that. I happen to have had a conversation with somebody inside Barn, and this is how I know this. Somebody who does this can't be trusted with them. No, I know, I know, but that's in an ideal world. I, I know and that. If something incident. happened to them, then no. the social service. Yeah, he trusted. left them for 45 minutes for a punishment. They, they disobeyed him or disrespected him or whatever he perceived. They wouldn't speak to him, was what yeah. apparently. So he left them on the side of the road, and God love them, they climbed up on a little wall and they just sat on a wall feeling totally and utterly abandoned. It's horrendous. That's very dangerous to leave small children yeah. by a roadside. Yeah, I know that. It only takes a click of a finger for somebody to drive by and decide to pick them up and take them away and kill them. Yeah, I know, I know. God you know, them. that's God highly them. dangerous to be doing right. that. So the social services weren't very pleased about this. And um, he had no stable relationship with them. Plus, they didn't want to live with him. And... Um, I don't believe he took them to the Philippines or any place else because I don't believe that they would have gone with him. I don't believe that. Well, um, they're only children. So if he says, and the social workers say, you're going on holiday with daddy, which I was told they did. And I kind of, I'm 60, 40. I believe they did. I was told that he didn't want to take them out of foster care because he didn't want to be fully responsible for them. Yes, he doesn't want them for no. a kick -off. But I was told that he... They don't have, want him either. No, I know. But I was told that he had unlimited, unsupervised access to them at weekends and mm -hmm. for holidays. And I, well, the mother has all been told the same. No, no, she hasn't. I've seen photographs of him with the children unsupervised. I've right, had, well... I've had reports where he's been in Hampstead with the children. Get down! That's the dog. Naughty boy. Girl. Um, I've had... Uh, come and say hello, Ruby. Come here. Come and say hello. No, all right then. Um, she's, just not, she's just camera shy. Oh, look. Isn't she lovely? Say hello. Hello, Ruby. Oh, hello. look. She's hello. gorgeous. Anyway, no, so, but that's beside the point. Like, I hope that it's true that he no longer has access to them. Well, that's but, what Ella was told, isn't it, when she phoned the social because I heard that radio broadcast. Yeah, that was great news. Even though, even though I do believe she was complicit, but I don't think she was anything near on the scale that Ricky Dearman was. But she needs to fess up to what she was complicit in. And I, before we spoke... I was saying my prayers and I actually am ready to say who gave me in September last year the intelligence that Ella's device had been hacked for the price, modest price of £3,000 and that two videos in particular were found on her device. One of a woman masturbating Gabriel aged about three and although it wasn't conclusive that it was Ella, it certainly indicated such. And the other video was of a disabled boy. This was a snuff movie, which Ella was also alleged to have been complicit in distributing. It was a disabled boy being raped and sodomized and then set on fire by Ricky Dearman. Like, oh, Jesus Christ. So I've taken the heat. Did you see these alleged videos? No, no. The person that gave me the intel last September and had been trying to give it to me for at least six months said that, that 
um, it had been reported to MI6, the evidence had been given to MI6, MI6 had said off the record that they would put surveillance on both Abe and on, on both Ricky and Ella and well, they, they would be dealing with it. Why would MI6 be looking into this? Because this is all in the UK. No, uh, you see, no, you see. Outside of the UK, they don't deal with I anything. know, I know, but the thing is, I think what's becoming more and more clear, somebody with Pizzagate, a supposed CIA insider, said the reason that the Americans were dragging their feet about fully exposing Pizzagate was because it could bring the British establishment down. I think it's become very clear that Hampstead... Well, tell us who told you this. Tell uh, us the name of the person. Right, that's what I'm going to do, right? Yes. And this is not, this is not done flippantly. So I'll just give you some background first. The person that gave me the intel is married to somebody who predominantly lives in Saudi Arabia. He's the child of an Anglo-Iranian parentage. His father was in the Royal Air Force for a long time, and he was married to a woman from Iran. And his father was, I think, dishonorably discharged from the Royal Air Force after quite a lot of long time service. And I don't know if it was on espionage grounds or I can't remember the grounds that his father was dishonorably discharged. But anyway, when his father was discharged from the Royal Air Force, he then became a spy. He was, you know the way they'll fire you and then they'll instantly re-recruit you. Right, we know you've been fired, but we'll give you 200 grand or whatever it is to now go underground and be one of our assets. So this person, her father-in-law was alleged to have been, well, he was definitely ex-Royal Air Force. He was definitely married to an Iranian woman. And he was alleged to have gone over, after being dishonorably discharged, he was alleged to have then been recruited as a spy. Um, the son, uh, who's probably 40, works mostly in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I just pray in Jesus' name that the offspring, the children are protected, but the, the son's name is Toby and his wife's name, who was my source, the um, intel that I was given, is Carolyn Cotier. She goes on Facebook by Lalita Noir. She was in, well, she was interviewed along with myself by Melanie Abbott of Radio 4. Well, this is going back Hampstead more than two years ago. She and I were both interviewed um, by Melanie Abbott of BBC Radio 4, thinking that we were Hampstead residents, which we weren't. Um, she lives in Luton. He lives in and works in Saudi Arabia. His father is ex-Royal Air Force, married to an Iranian and, and uh, alleged by Carolyn to have been recruited as MI6 after his uh, Air Force career ended. So the thing that gave me the courage to release her name was that Kristen Elizabeth, the one that said when she was blocked by Chris Costa, it, it synchronistically blocked her from Shiva Burton. She said to me that she had defended Chris Costa to the moon and back because she didn't want Chris's children uh, targeted. And it's the same with Carolyn. She and Toby have a child who's very adorable, but I've protected her since September and my children have been targeted. And here's me protecting her. Now she hung me out to dry. She gave me this intel in September. And but how does she know this thing anyway? From her husband and from the MI6 contacts. But why would they tell her? Because she's the wife of an agent. Well, they're not supposed to keep everything. Still. Well, they're not supposed to tell their wives, but isn't it true that, you know, that's how the most old fashioned spying ever went, went on. It pillow was, talk. Pillow talk, exactly. So, uh, but this is where it broke down because her husband gave her, you know, her husband didn't like her being involved with researching Hampstead. So, 
he allegedly paid somebody three grand to go and hack Ricky and Ella's devices. The devices turned out that it was to do with drugs, it was to do with the Russian mafia, and uh, that Ella had pimped the children from a young age, and that Ella was furious because Ricky stiffed her for £240,000. He, he... Well, where's the £240,000 now then? Well, apparently, apparently he, he, Ricky was too greedy and the Russian mafia were paying Ricky commission, but he was taking the commission and then he was taking more than the commission and then he was pimping the children at school secretly without Ella's knowledge. And then she felt like she'd been stiffed of 240,000 and so she blew the whistle on him. So although I don't think she was as complicit, and this is all allegedly, although I don't think she was as complicit, I do think the Russian drug cartel side of things might have been her side of the business. And that um, she was definitely a co-director with Ricky with, um, it was supposed to be health and nutrition websites but they were porn and snuff distribution websites but i just want you to say on camera what you thought and i think you know fairly good grounds you thought you'd seen abra now i must say this first oh I have no, no, I let me just say this one. first let me just say this first the intel carolyn cotier aka lolita noir gave me was that ironically the innocent person in this whole drama was abraham no, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. Right, well, she said, according to the MI6 investigation, MI5, MI6, whatever, that Ricky was the most guilty, Ella was pretty dirty in the involvement, and Abraham was just the petty crook who got... He was going to be a patsy. Abraham was intended to be the patsy. He was just a small-time drug dealer had some anger management issues, and then the part you told me off camera last time, possibly a pimp. So tell us about... Yeah. Tell little us one about of these pimps, little spivs. I encountered them once. I used to work in um, this um, hotel for... that was mainly elderly Jewish ladies that lived there, but there were some men that came to work in London during the week, like sales executives. And they used to stay there five days during the week and go home at the weekend and come back on the Monday. And this was in Queensway? No, no, no. Queensway is where I was um, an author's researcher. And then <laughs> I ended up throwing the police van wearing my Carmen rollers and my blue fluffy slippers. <laughs> well, because I was, I got this job, I was only 19 and I got this job as an author's researcher for this woman who looked like Mrs. Bradley off the Mrs. Bradley <laughs> mystery. She lived in some big house in the west country and she gave me these little books and i was to write everything about everybody and you know to gather um um information for her because she was going to write crime novels so I'm, i didn't realize what a red light area was i didn't know i knew i knew there was i knew the word prostitutes and hookers but i didn't know what they did to be honest with you <laughs> I, well, I know, I know it's hilarious. I, this, this woman, she knew exactly what she was employing. She advertised in the lady magazine. And she advertised in such a way as to attract somebody who um, wouldn't know what they were doing. In fact. So I'm sitting in the window of my hotel room every day and every night, and I'm writing down everything about the regular people I saw walking around and about the police who were coming into the hotel and collecting brown envelopes off the pimps and thinking about a case of a girl called Julie Smith who was she was pimped out at 13 by Mick the Dick who was a copper. Mick the Dick was a serving copper in South East London and he had gotten Julie Smith from Yorkshire and brought her to London. She was in some sort of foster care oh. and if she didn't come back with a thousand pounds a day he used to beat her with metal hoover poles. Oh. oh, he broke. She'd broken arms. She'd broken legs. She'd her face smashed in. She'd black eyes. And everything. Um, and he would still. He'd, she'd have her arm in plaster, and he'd have her out in the street the next day. Well, she was murdered at sixteen, and I believe Mister Dick killed her. 
a lot of people believe Mick the Dick killed her because three other people who knew about Mick the Dick, three other hookers who were older, well, they weren't that much older, they were the early 20s. Over a period of six months, they turned up dead as well after she was dead because, well, they tried to take her away from Mick the Dick and put her back in Yorkshire and he went straight back to Yorkshire and took her from the foster house and brought her back to London. So, um, I mean, she, she saw me writing down and I'd be sat at the bus stop sitting and I'd be looking at everybody and writing. I mean, that's not something you should be doing in the middle of a danger. No, 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 you would be, you had been recruited. You just didn't know it. You'd been recruited. This woman wanted, she wanted information to write crime novels. Well, why no, didn't she? No, that's a cover story. That's between, a cover story. That's no, cover no, she did. No, no, she, she wanted to write crime novels. But why, why didn't she put herself in the middle of Queen's by watching these bloody people? She wanted a young girl of a certain age and she, she wanted somebody who was naive enough not to be scared to do this. I didn't know there was any danger in sitting, writing down and giving, you know, like um, the Harriet the Spy novels. No, and I, I totally was understand. Thinking, That's how they I got was, me. They would send me into life and death situations, but I had no fear. I was so naive, I had no clue that at any given moment I could be fucking bumped off. That's how they do it. That's how they well, do people. The police and the pimps conspired together. Because I set my foot and I had the Carmen rollers in and blue fluffy slippers on. And I thought, I'll go to, you know, you know the ones with little heels, little Marilyn Monroe slippers. <laughs> I know the and Carmen thought, rollers as well. I, mean, I had the Carmen rollers in. And I thought, um, well, I'll go to... This side door was just across the, from the door of the hotel, just across this side street. And I thought, I'll go and I'll get a sandwich and a drink. So it was nearly eight o'clock and Boots was going to shut. So I'm sure I come out the front door of the hotel, stepped out in the slippers and the rollers, and I was grabbed and thrown. And I hit this metal surface and I thought, what's going on here? And the first thing that came into my head, I looked up, I was like, I was, laid on the floor in this metal surface and I looked up and there was three coppers sat on a bench in the back of the sandwich van, in the back of the police van. I didn't know it was in a police van, I was just taken and thrown. I didn't see the police van, I was just thrown and bang, I hit this metal surface. And I looked up and I saw these coppers and I thought, where am I? And I thought, I'm in the TARDIS. <laughs> and then I thought, no, wait a minute, TARDIS doesn't exist. The TARDIS is not real. You're not in a TARDIS. I thought, love, where are you? And I'm thinking to myself, what is going on here? And I'm thinking, oh, my roller's still there. And I'm, I'm, oh, oh. And I'm thinking, have any pins come out of And I'm looking at these coppers and I'm sitting laughing. And I'm thinking, what the hell is happening here? So they took me to Paddington Green Police Station in my Carmen roller and my blue fluffy slippers. And they took me in the back of the police station, in through the back, and they took me into the suite where they take, because Pension Green was where they used to take terrorists to question. And they took me into the suite they used to question terrorists. And they said to me, nobody knows you're here. Um, they said, we can keep you here till you do tell us what we want. They said, what are you doing? Because Mick the Dick had pulled his car up beside me when I was walking along the street in broad daylight and he said to me, I want to talk to you. And I knew who he was. Mr. Smith. They, Mr. Smith. Mick the, no, Mick the Dick. We oh, called Mick him Dick. Mick the right. Dick. Right, he was a copper. Copper. Well, Mrs. Cresser the Dick, the new chief constable, what an unfortunate name for a policewoman. Dick, Mrs. Dick. <laughs> How unfortunate she's called Cresser the Dick, isn't it? And she's the new chief constable. I know. <laughs> well, we called him Mick the Dick because his name was Smith. And um, Julie Smith had approached me asking me, do you live here? Why are you living here? And what are you doing? And she should um been quite quizzing me and questioning me. And I had I'd said to her, what age are you? And she said, 15. I said, and what are you out doing this for at 15? Oh, I have to. She seemed to think that he was doing her a great favor by pimping her out. I couldn't believe her mentality when I spoke to her. I just couldn't believe it. And she turned up with these plaster casts in her arm and I said, what happened? She says, well, he did this because I come back short of money. 
she come back with a few pounds short of the thousand pounds. But tell us about seeing Abraham or thinking you saw Abraham. Well, anyway, yes, it wasn't in Queensway because in Queensway, anyway, I was taken into the back of the police station, the Paddington Green, and they said, um, you've come from Ireland. So how did they know? This was in about the April time. I had come back from Ireland and having been there for seven years, I had come back from Ireland in the January. So how did these coppers know that I had come from Ireland? Because you were a CIA or GCHQ, MI5 asset without realising. You were recruited through the Lady magazine, supposedly to do research for crime novels, but you were just naive. You were recruited as a spy to take note of who was coming and going and what they were doing. Oh no, she just wanted to know about what the hookers were doing and I don't, I don't, I mean, she, she looked like Mrs. Bradley. She, it was very bizarre when I went, it was very, very bizarre because I was told to come for an interview and she paid for a first class ticket. Yeah. And when I got to the small station, it was like a stately home this woman lived in. And what there was, was her name? Name? What was her name? I can't remember. Oh. Lady something or other. Um, there was maids in black and white uniform and there was butlers and there were chauffeurs because chauffeur picked me up at the station. Yeah. And she was like, she was like some kind of character Francis Francis Delator would play. She was like something out of the 1920s. No, I you, think... you were recruited as a spy. You just didn't realise. Well, it. Well, could have recruited anybody. It didn't have to be. Yeah, no, never... no. But you were already prime candidate because you'd already been traumatised as a child. And you were already targeted as a Oh, child. no, I found out how the police knew that I was here. Because when I had left Ireland, somebody in an establishment in Parnell Square, a person called Jim, phoned the British authorities and yeah. told them that I was some sort of Irish Republican. And yeah. I had gone to the main... Because Jim told me what he'd done, because yeah. I knew Jim from the Magnet Bar. So yeah. Jim made a false allegation about me. Yeah, yeah. You were already and flagged. The, you were already flagged. Yeah. So anyway, what did, so the, what did Paddington police do with you? Well, they were they were saying to me, "What do you know about who you know?" And I was too busy with Marone or something. <laughs> I was too busy thinking if I lost any pins out of these rovers. I'm thinking, how am I supposed to get back? <laughs> Queen, how am I supposed to walk from Paddington in a pair of slippers? <laughs> oh, I did. I, I did have to. Yes, I did have to. I grew up through the streets in daylight. It's like the walk, oh, of, the walk of shame. I had to walk back from Paddington Green Police Station to wear boots is in Queensway in my slippers and my rollers. <laughs> yes, when they got fed up, they thought I was a bit of a loony. Well, I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> it turns out this gym told them quite a story about me, quite yeah. a few lies about me. <clears throat> And um, th why did they believe him? He was calling I know, him. I know. You know, why did they even believe him? So, well, he must have been some sort of British agent in yeah. among the Republicans in Southern yeah. Ireland. He must have already knew the British for them to be believing him. So, um, eventually, they told me to get out of the police station. I think I, I think I, I think I fried the. <laughs> because, I, because I was saying, who are you talking about? They were, asking, they were asking me about this person, that person. And I'm saying, what film are they in? I'm saying, what, what are you talking about? Is this film you're talking about? <laughs> it, was like, it was like me and the police were both talking like gibberish. Because they were talking gibberish at me and I was talking gibberish back. I was asking them, Is, are you reciting a movie? No, but I know, I know, I know with hindsight that you were a CIA, uh, uh, you were an MI5 agent, but you didn't know you were, which suggests to me that you were MK Ultra. But it's like that's. But I didn't know what they were twattering on about. That... I had no clue what they were talking about. <laughs> but that's they were talking what, that's... <laughs> that's why they couldn't interrogate us as spies because. We honestly didn't know, so they just said, couldn't interrogate blah, blah, me because blah. I didn't know what we, we were on saying, about. Sorry, pardon? <laughs> no, I thought they were talking to me about some movies. So yeah. I, you know, I said, which film, what <laughs> film you're talking about? And they're looking at me, Phil, and they're looking at each other as if, you know, so wrong with that. <laughs> and they eventually, they eventually got fed up 
and told me to get out of their station. Right, right, right. So, uh, I mean... But anyway, fast forward... They, to what they wanted to know, what they basically wanted to know was why I was writing things down yeah. about the police yeah. and the, and the yeah. prostitutes. The pimps and the police, the, some of the police were pimps. Yeah. And they wanted to know because the Nick the Dick, when he approached me, he said to me, um, I'm not a policeman. Are you in the police? And I thought to myself, yes, you fucking are a policeman because you're Mick the Dick. But I never said anything to him. Yeah. I said, oh. Yeah. He said, are you in the police? And I never answered him. Yeah. And yeah. he said, um, do you mind me asking what are you doing? I said, oh, I don't mind you asking what am I doing at all. I was just on my way to that shop. He meant, what are you doing here? I know, I know, I know. Why are you writing things down? Yeah. And I thought, you cheeky dog asking me what I'm doing, what's got to do with you, I thought. Why didn't you mind your own business? So he tried to question me as to why I, because he, what he seemed to think, the gist of his conversation, he thought that I was some kind of copper that was there to watch what the police were doing with the pimps. And he wanted to know if he was at risk of being caught for what he was up to with this young girl. <laughs> so I think this is, um, I think he has tipped other ones off and the frab men threw me into this stuff. What they really wanted to know was why was I spying on the police and the prostitutes? Yeah, yeah. They wanted but, to know if you were a spy, but you didn't, yes. know, you didn't know you were a spy, so therefore you couldn't spill. But fast forward to the Abraham bit. Well, after I left, uh, this was the second time I was back in London and I was in... Golders Green and Finchley and Hampstead working in hotels. So I got this job um, managing uh, like a it was like a hotel guest house place on Finchley Road. And um, I wasn't there very long. And I come into the dining the um, breakfast room, and there was a person I can identify as being this a Christie with this other bloke. The other bloke was either from. Sierra Leone or Nigeria. And, and the two of them with long coats on, they looked like right little sisters. They looked like little boys dressed in their father's clothes. Because Abraham Christie is, I think he's got little man syndrome. That's the reason for him to kind of push people around because he's a little man. It's like little yeah. dogs have it. My yeah, dog, no, my, my dog, yeah. used to have it. And I think the same Christie, I think he. I don't think he would stand up to another man. I think he likes to be going around pushing women around. Now, there were some ladies um, who rented rooms in this establishment who paid for their children to go to the boarding school and they went out wearing wigs and... <laughs> anyway, I think they were going out to hotels to ply their business of an evening, these women. I didn't put my nose into what they were doing because they paid their rent and it was their own business what they were up to. But I think... He and this other one knew that there was a few of these women living in the place. Anyway, I came to find him seated in my breakfast room and I wasn't the best pleased because he wasn't meant to be in there because he didn't live in the place. He didn't rent right. a room. There. So I said to the two of them, who are you? Oh, Felix, we're friends of Felix's. I said, Felix doesn't live here. Felix was the owner. Well, we're friends of Felix. As Felix allows us, we come and watch the place. I said, well, I'm managing the place now, so I don't require you to be watching anything. Wow. And um, I think they would have liked to have been um, punting off these ladies. You would call it punting. So do you think they, they, they knew that there were ladies of the night plying their trade? Oh, yeah. They weren't plying it from the, the building. They were going off to other areas of, of London. Um, some One of them used to get phone calls from men, all different men. I used to answer the phone. So I think that was maybe her client making an appointment with her. Um, the gist of the, because I could hear the conversations when I was in the breakfast room, she's in the hall on the phone. So the gist I got of that was that these were people booking appointments with her. I didn't, it was none of my business as long as she's paying her rent, as long as she's not bringing them to the actual So once, once you said to Abraham and the other guy. Well, they're very, he's a cheeky little dog as well. Because I'd say I'm, I'd be bigger than Abraham Christie, actually, in size. And um, the, two, the, the one with him was a right cheeky snapper. Oh, I have been in this country for 23 years. I have got a British passport. 
I said, I couldn't care less what you've got. I said, in British passports can be revoked. And if you don't get out here, I'll be calling up the Home Office and I'll be having you deported. Look, I'm not doing anything to me. I said, do you want to bet about that? I was all set to get the pair of them to the back to their coat and run them out the door. And did they go once you... Once you oh, it's them? Because um, some... Uh, this guy who used... Who, he was a, one of these sales executive people. And he could hear all the commotion. He came down and he said, uh, is everything okay? And they decided they would leave. And um, they ran out the door. But the other one, not the Abraham Christie, the other one came back on another occasion, the, the cheeky Nigerian or one from Sarah. And they came back the next week to find him back in my bloody breakfast room. I was raging. I was, so I actually threw him out on that occasion. Well, shortly after that, I left, but they had been uh, wanting, during when they were in the breakfast room, they were talking about various people who lived in the place upstairs, you know, um, residents. And um, the gist, what were they wanting anything to do with these women for? Oh, I think he's a little wannabe pimp, but I don't think he could be pimping out that Ella because she's far too old. Well, Ella, I don't know. I've got a theory and I'll just ask it as a question. She's obviously well-educated. Her parents are obviously well-educated, you know, um, but I do wonder... I do wonder at any point, was she a high-class escort? How did she end up, first of all, with cult member Will Draper? then passed on to cult member Ricky Dearman, then uh, pulling in possible pimp, small-time crook, Abraham Christie, in Hampstead in a multi-million pound property. I don't know. I just asked the question, is it possible that Ella came to London as a high-class escort? I don't know. I'm just asking that question. Well, I'll tell you, I've seen high class escorts because the hotels that I lived in, um, at least two of them ran escort agencies. And high class escorts don't look like Ella Draper. She'd be more your pound land. Um, she hasn't got the looks for it. Well, I'm not being, I'm not being funny, but she does not have. The OK, look. so maybe the drug connection. Maybe it's her brains. I don't know. I don't know. I would love to her be what? very strong. Her, her brains. Well, she, if she gets mixed up with that stupid bugger Abraham Christie, she hasn't got any brains. No, but he was, he was a patsy. I, she first got mixed oh. up with Will Draper and had a child with him, James, who is alleged by the children to have also been in the cult and also abusing. Then she was passed on to Ricky Dearman, had the two children, and her version is that she knew nothing. But I have to say, to get graphic, I know what it's like to be a mother in denial. But at the same time, she's alleged to have given the children enemas for constipation. And if those children were being sodomized and raped from childhood, which I believe they were, you would not... I get it very hard to believe that she saw no evidence of them being multiple abuse. Uh, well, what this Garland, Garland woman um, seemed to say, because at the beginning um, she, was, she was saying to me about it's either, either her daughter-in-law and her niece or her daughter and her niece live in Hampstead, but she has relatives in Chatham, in Man any place you mention, she's got a stream of relatives in it. She's from Northern Ireland. I think they all came over during feuds when there was various I think she's from some kind of organisation, family or something. And when there was feuds, there would be more of them come over here to escape being killed by their own type. Yeah, they'd be exiled, yeah. Well, the seems to be, well, I think the amount of them she's got, she could form a large army and take the bloody place over. Yeah, no, no, it was very common. Like, I've had threats like that. You've got 24 hours to leave, and, and most people would leave. Well, she has relatives everywhere up and down this flaming country she has enough relatives to be bigger than the british army as far as i could see so anyway she seemed to say that this ella draper was a key teacher yes yeah, she was she taught yoga 
She taught facial yoga. She taught. What? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Some of it's good stuff, but she... what yoga? <laughs> face, <laughs> face yoga. <laughs> face yoga. <laughs> oh, like Beverly Callard. Um, I have a Beverly Callard tape, and at the end of it, she does these exercises. <laughs> no, she's got some very the good information. I do believe her information about if I could grow cannabis plants, I would, and then I would juice them. I wouldn't roll joints, I don't know how to, but I would grow cannabis plants in Lanzarote where it's legal, and I would chop them up and put them in with broccoli and asparagus and onions and cabbage, and I would juice them. She's got a lot of good information. I do believe, uh, it's hard to say this, but I do believe on some level she loved her children, but I just don't think she's telling the truth about her full involvement in the cult. Well, the Garland woman seemed to think that because she was asking me, um, I never said, I never went into the fact that I had received the, because I took myself off that bloody Sabine mailing list thing. Because if you go to look at anything on Sabine's site, she harvests your details. No, everybody does that. that. Really... That's the internet. Everybody does no, that. No, she actually makes you give your email address. Yeah, every, everybody speak. has to. That's part of, that's data collection. She's a data analyst, scientist type person. Everybody who runs a blog or a website, that's where the gold is. You harvest the email addresses. Oh, she's the fruitcake, but anyway, she... She met before, she blocks the screen so you can't read it. So that she blackmails you into giving her your email address. No, and it's I, not blackmail. That's how they do it, honestly. That's because Well, I've, I have never seen anybody else do it like this. No, they do. They ask you, would you like to sign up to their email address? And you can remove the thing from the screen and continue reading. But with her, you can't. Either you sign up or you don't read anything. But anyway, I was on her mailing list. And I didn't realize the danger of being on her mailing list. And she was sending dangerous stuff around. You could be jailed for having. And um, when I took myself off in 2013, I told her exactly what I thought of her meddling in people's family court issues where she has no expertise and she doesn't know the law. She put me back on her mailing list. And she didn't, I couldn't get myself taken off. Every time I took myself off, she was putting me back on and sending me more old tripe. I was going mental because she was sending me all this rubbish that I, that I just did not want to hear from her. So she sent me stuff around about this Hampstead thing. That, that I, I, had just, I just deleted it. I never bothered. I thought it's her again. It's nuts. And I deleted the stuff. But then along came this dark woman and she she happened to mention the Hampstead thing to me when we went to do the filing in the high court that day. And I said, oh, I've heard about it, but it has nothing to do with it. I don't know anything about it. She said, oh, well, but you know about family law. Have you nothing to do with this thing? And I said, no, nothing to do with it. I never even mentioned to her that I'd received this stuff. Because she probably, the next thing I'd know, she knows the thing, because she knows everybody. So I never mentioned having received any stuff about it but um, on another occasion she was talking about the um, Hampstead thing and about her either the either the daughter-in-law or daughter and the niece and she was saying that the Ella was a keep fit teacher she never said anything about face yoga no she was she never... a yoga she was a yoga teacher and she ran a facial yoga blog and her and Abraham but her, her and Ricky also. Her and Ricky ran nutrition blogs and both were devotees of Cheng Hai or something, some cult. But those... Cheng Hai, is, it's copied from the Monkey Magic TV show. Supreme, from the book of well, Supreme Master. Anyway, it, they've got a TV station and on the surface they seem to be promoting meditation and yoga and veganism and healthy living but it all links into child pornography and snuff distribution. So Mel... Yeah, I know about so, Shanghai, and Shanghai is a person, and she's a greedy little person, and she wants them to give all their money to her. She's being yeah. amazed. It's a cult. It's a cult. 
but it's associated with Bill and Hillary Clinton. It's associated with child trafficking. It's associated with um, child pornography and snuff movies, allegedly, right? So that so it traces back to all of that. So and then and then um, Ella had a business. I've got recordings where they told me about running daytime workshops in Hampstead about nutrition and facial yoga. And, well, maybe that's where she knew. And they were making about... I don't mean she knew they're from the internet. I mean that these... Yeah, no, they were running workshops. They actually know her, know her. Yeah, no, her. yeah, I believe you because her and Abraham, and I've got this on recording, they were doing one-day workshops and making 3,000 a day in and around the Hampstead area, teaching people about nutrition and yoga and blah blah meditation and so on and so forth so look at okay, they had to pay a lot of money to go to these these uh keep fit classes workshop things yeah yeah but i think it all is a gateway i think they're all you know maybe all mostly a, yeah, gate, a I'll gateway tell you what i think if mrs gartland could be paying for expensive and um, keep fit classes she could have been paying for a solicitor instead of having yeah. me do it yeah of course of course Look, I've got to go. I've got a family wedding tomorrow, and I've got lots of things to do to get to get ready for it. But it's been brilliant connecting with you. I'm kind of scared about releasing my source, but at the same time, why? Well, because that. All right, I'll just be upfront about it. According to her, she and her husband were involved with exposing a huge pedophile ring. I suspect it was the do true pedophile ring in Belgium. And as a result of their work, she is a brilliant researcher. As a result of their work, there were death threats upon her and her son. And so her husband, who I suspect is MI6, who works in Saudi Arabia, he told her she had to live in England, separate from him with their son, because there were death threats on her life. Now, my personal thoughts are he's getting his cake and eating it because he's got this beautiful wife and child safely ensconced in Luton with the grandparents helping and he's in Saudi Arabia you know working for big bucks and probably also working for MI6 and and uh, having a ball he's got a wife and child safely at home and he's he's having the life of Riley but that's just my thoughts but Anything else quickly before we, like, we'll do this again. I really got, I should show you, I got lots of feedback. People love this, this thing. And yeah. I appreciate you. And I know, it, and I'm sorry you've been trolled. I really am sorry. Oh, well, now, hoaxers have, they're the authors of their own destruction. Because they have published, they happen to say to somebody on their commentaries, Oh, the police contacted us and got us to take something down off our site. So they're not anonymous because the police have contacted them already. So that means they are contactable. I don't so know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 They're not anonymous. But they also have done something that would really alarm a judge. They have put on their commentaries um, a link and also published the full article written by a, a person who I know. I gave him an interview, you know, about the Belfast City Council carry on. Wow. And I gave him a document um, from Belfast for him to, to publish. So he published this on his, he works for online newspapers. And he published it in the cross, I think it was Cross Border News or something he published it in. And they have gotten this and they have put it onto their commentary site and said, oh, look, look, here's her address if anybody wants to go there. But haha, it's not my address. On the letter that I gave to the bloke for him to publish on the online newspaper, they must think I'm really daft because they think I would give him a document that's got my actual address on it. Yeah. No, it doesn't have my address on it. So if they want to go there, the address that's on that. There's document. somebody contacted me from America that's been harassed by them and she's disabled. She's a survivor. And she said that American law, it's a crime to harass and bully somebody with a disability. 
So she's looking into taking legal action on that angle because they, oh, I mean, they terrorized her. Finally Norman, you know, the fake profile of Finally Norman, terrorized her in inbox messages to the point where that... she was locking all her doors and she's been, she's disabled and she's been scratching her head with anxiety, picking her head until it bleeds because they've terrorized her so much. Well, Finally Norman, it has been said, is Ricky Dearman. Yeah, I think I maybe believe that, although that intel may... Yeah, but it may have come from Chris Costa, who I don't trust. But if it is Ricky Dearman, and I was told that these people, even before Hampstead Blue, they had a habit of targeting and stalking and harassing disabled people, which is just horrendous. It's just horrendous. Yeah. So look it, let's connect again. I'll get this family wedding done tomorrow. And, and let's maybe just do another show in a week or so. Yeah, all right. All right, Pepsi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love you. Ciao. Okay, bye.